宮司近江と東条が五分の杯やあちにいや、九一の間違いとちゃうんか Ryuji Gold is built up to be a monstrous dragon coming to Kamurocho to burn it all to ashes. But he simply misunderstood man with burning passion to prove his value to the Yakuza, his adopted father, but most importantly, he has to prove to himself that he's worthy of being a dragon. <laughs> We're introduced to Ryuji when one of his lackeys blabbers about his reputation of being the Dragon of Kansai. Kansai no Ryuya. All eyes glare to him as Ryuji excuses the ladies for what he's about to do. He pours the lackey's drink until it overflows and smashes the bottle on his head, making sure it'll jog his memory to never refer to him as the Dragon of Kansai ever again. Kansai no Ryu te ittanda. After a barbaric introduction, he displays his more professional persona by giving Kiryu an apology for his boy's rude aggression. Kiryu shares his disdain for Ryuji's crew's abrasiveness, but Ryuji lightly brushes it off with a laugh as he shares his interest in Kiryu by offering to buy him a round of drinks. It's only when he learns that the stranger is Kazuma Kiryu that his demeanor changes. His calmness is abrupted by intense ferocity as he glares at Kiryu. It's only broken into laughter when he believes the stranger should not be the other dragon he's actually searching for. <laughs> Ryuji lives for battle. He doesn't want peace in the underground world of the Yakuza. He's willing to start fireworks in Kamurocho to disrupt any talks of restfulness, and he wants to be seen as the strongest dragon. He can't have another dragon like Kiryu walking his earth. He's gunning for Kiryu so he can abandon the Kansai in his name. <laughs> Ryuji holds a grudge against his adopted father. The two don't share any ideals. His father is meeting with Kiryu to settle things between clans, to talk about uniting everyone and stop any senseless fighting. Getting rid of conflict would leave Ryuji without purpose. What does the title of Dragon have if there's no spark to bring out his flames? If the talks go through, Ryuji's reputation would become meaningless, as a time of peace would not need a dragon to strike fear. During the meeting, Ryuji encounters Daiko who accuses him of framing him and putting him in jail for five years. Ryuji has no recollection of this and has no time to waste with a nobody. Ryuji is too prideful to mess with small fish like Daiko. He insults him and quickly puts him down to take over the meeting. This coup d'etat is the spark for the dragon of Kansai to start a war. He wants everyone engulfed in his flames as the embers of peace die out. Ryuji fights it out with Kiryu to put his plans into motion, but it's cut short when the police arrive. Ryuji makes his return during the funeral of Terada, but he's not looking for a fight. It's gotten everyone there curious. Why would such a bloodthirsty man like Ryuji show up but not bear his fangs? They're on their toes looking for any underhanded tactics Ryuji may slip out. He reassures them that he too has a semblance of humanity. He's only there to pay his respects to Terada and offer them money for their troubles. Although, in a rather patronizing way, by throwing the cash to the ground with a smug look on his face, he has no desire to put the funeral in flames. <laughs> Ryuji makes his exit by letting them know he'll give them three days to mourn the dead before he returns for war. We've only seen Ryuji act with brash vigor so far, but this funeral brings to light his somewhat more humane side. He's not some corrupt man who can't honor the people around him. When speaking of Sengoku, he refers to him as a dirty old bastard, showing that even he has his own code of honor. Ryuji doesn't like playing dirty, and shows some disdain for even partnering with the sniveling Sengoku. Ryuji carries himself as a hulk, but he knows when it's time to set his pride aside and show respect to those who deserve it. He's painted as a monster from those around him, deservedly so. 
But even this ogre has its redeeming qualities. Seeing Haruka captured by Sengoku, Ryuji parts ways with the underhanded tactics and walks his own path to defeat Kiryu. He proves to Kiryu that he has dignity by killing Sengoku and letting Haruka return to him. As Kiryu takes out the Omi Alliance, Ryuji has the perfect opportunity to take him out, but... For being the antagonist of Kiwami 2, he shows his charisma by facing Kiryu only at his best. Ryuji's always felt alone and he needs to prove to himself that he's worthwhile. He needs to prove to his adopted father that he has purpose by doing what he couldn't. He has something to prove to himself by taking down the other dragon, Kiryu, and being the lone dragon. But Ryuji is cared for. When he was young, Date-san saved him during the Jingwan tragedy. He learns of Kaoru being his younger half-sister. Even with all of Ryuji's destruction, she cares for him even if she has to take him into prison. Feeling as though his mother had abandoned him, his adopted father tells him the truth. She truly did care for him, but had to let him go for the man he hates for raising him. But he doesn't have the same animosity, but rather cared for him like his own blood child. <coughs> but most importantly, Kiryu has the utmost respect for this brute. Even with all the harm he's caused, Kiryu can respect this man's pride. Sticking to his guns and doing things his own way honorably makes these two like kindred spirits. Both Ryuji and Kiryu are attracted to this sincerity in fighting. The only way to honor the other person is to go all out in a duel to the finish. If it weren't for being born into this tragedy, Ryuji could have lived a life as magnificent as Kiryu. So, Shishinno 